who is he and I'm making this video because I'm aware of the the effect that hip-hop culture has on society and the things that I'm going to be talking about in this video are often not associated with hip-hop culture um, the things I'm talking about are tech-based and innovative and um, releasing this video alongside the release of my song Dick Appointment featuring AI Drake because I want people who typically wouldn't look this way to be the first, pe first people to think about these types of things and applications um, because hip hop culture has a huge say so in society. You know, it's cool, people follow it and wanna mimic it. And if you guys can endorse this, then the things I'm talking about will be achievable for us and for society as a whole. But I know that if I don't say something interesting in the beginning of this video to grab your attention, then you won't take me seriously, but you need to. Um, so I first want to propose this idea to tackle future student debt. So I want you guys to think what if we had grown up and every day that we went to school and stayed the whole day, we got a little bit of cryptocurrency in a wallet that we couldn't touch until we graduated. And to take it a step further, what about for every A that we got? We could have gotten a little bit of more cryptocurrency. And to take it a little bit further, Think about when you were in high school and your extracurriculars that you did. You know, were you in the swim on the swim team? Did you play football, play chess in the chess club? Um, those could have been more ways of earning cryptocurrency in your wallet that you couldn't access until you graduated. And when you did, you had two options. You could keep most of it and pay more than most in taxes or you could use that money to pay for your higher education that way you wouldn't go into student debt and or have student debt that would most likely burden you for the rest of your life um, education wise you could have I could have learned everything I learned on the internet and I studied computer science and our program was not very rigorous and honestly, I didn't even graduate, you know. I have two credits left. Two credits, yeah, you heard that right. Why wouldn't you graduate? Well, I don't believe that a piece of paper can tell me what I can and cannot do, you know. I've already worked in the industry and seen what you do. And I'll show you guys my resume to, to prove that, you know. I'm someone who can code, who understands code, but where I struggle as a developer, it, uh, I'm someone when you have like a blank project and you really don't know what to do, you kind of get overwhelmed with the vastness of your ideas and what needs to be done to get everything together. I think a lot of other people who are in tech probably struggle with that. And I want to relate to as many people as I can because I'm relatable, you know, I'm, I'm very human. Um, I have good days, I have bad days. I'm prescribed Ambien to help me, help my anxiety, help, help me be more social mainly. Um, I'm very shy in real life. And even talking to my, I'm essentially talking to myself in front of a camera, I feel very weird about that, but I have dreams and aspirations like you guys. And I realized that from the very first song that I wrote that I'm not good at this, I'm great at this. And I owe it to myself to, to pursue that to its fullest extent. And doing a video like this is, is doing that for myself. Um, because, you know, 
I, I want you guys to see my room. That, like, this is my room. This is where Dick Appointment was made on my Scarlet interface, my Audio Technica mic. I don't have a studio. I've never stepped foot in a studio, to be honest. I don't have a producer, a sound engineer, um, a mastering engineer, all of the things that really make you, the music that you hear pop. I, I hear these beats online and I, and I write to them because, um, you know, I have a lot of thoughts and I have personality. But before I get into the tech part of this video, I want you guys to know my music goals that I have for myself because I do have goals and aspirations like you guys and I want to fulfill my capabilities as a musician, as a lyricist, and as a society member going into the tech part so I can ultimately leave the world a better place than I found it. Um, music goals that I have for myself are three. I want to sh I want to first sell this song as a di uh, sell dick appointment as an NFT. That way, I can fund my other two goals mainly. And what a potential investor should know about owning this song is you own it in its entirety. You know, the only thing that you could not do is if I get to a point to where I perform at a venue or something, you could not hinder me in any way of. Uh, performing that song but owning it in its entirety you know i expect you to receive the streaming revenue you can make advertisement advertisements promoting your song you know i wrote it i performed it but it's your song and how you guys should think of it as i know you see people sell their catalog off when they're near the end of their music career and you can think of this as selling my catalog off in real time um, because I understand the, the lifespan of a music artist is not very long unless you're either Taylor Swift or Drake. And that's kind of why I you am using Drake in this song because A, I wouldn't do it if I wasn't a fan of his. And B, you know, he has a lot of pull in the mu music industry. Um, you know... I don't want to speak on an ongoing beef between the two, but without him, the the beef doesn't exist, you know, so. But sell this song, one musical that I have for myself. The other is make an album, an industry standard album that conveys a lot of emotions. Every emotion that you can feel, ideally, you know, heartbreaking, love, fantasies, depression, success, your failures. Um, Cause I'm emotional, you know, I'm just like you. I, I experience these emotions quite frequently to be honest. Um, and I have songs portraying each of these emotions and selling the song as an NFT will help fund me to get the people around me to to help do that. And part of the reason why I'm doing this now is because I can feel myself peeking individually on what I can do with by myself, you know, with the equipment that I have. Um, if I have more people around me, the studio, the other ears when I'm doing, the, doing this, excuse me, this could be way better. And I'm, and I'm aware of that. And that's kind of why I've never promoted myself really before because I wasn't promotable um the quality wasn't there and now I feel like it's it's just good enough to where someone could someone could like me someone could could fuck with me because oh he he's cool he, he knows what he's talking about and you know of course I wouldn't have made dick appointment if I haven't ever had hoes who I had have had their dick appointment, you know, like I'm ho Izzy, I be fucking too, like straight up. So that's that. But the third goal that I have for myself is to win a Grammy. And I know you people be like, oh, you will never win a Grammy, da, 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 da. but you know, I believe it's possible for myself. And I want to give a speech at the Grammys mainly, not 
not because of the success or anything that would come with winning a Grammy, but to give a speech on a really grand stage that, I mean, I could say it right now, but it wouldn't, like, this is an introduction to me. Like, this could very much get just 100 views on YouTube and everyone around me be like, oh, this nigga's crazy. But if I say the speech on a really grand stage in front of the world, you know, people will respect me and people will look differently at life. And that's ultimately what I would, would try to do. Um, and before I get into the tech part, I just want to say two last things. The first is I won't be going into like code or anything like that, you know, just speaking at a very high level on the technology, not so much the implementation of it. That, that would be more, that's more of a discussion among all of us. Um, but since I am a songwriter, I am going to, when I start to feel it gets a little dull, I will play previews of songs that I have written that are not my best work, but are very much good songs and that any potential investor could be like, oh, I would really love that song if that came out. That's one thing. And the last thing is what I want you guys to understand about the things that I'm talking about in this video is these are only formed from the opinion and from the brain of one person. You know, I thought of these ideas in my head and had conversations with AI chatbots, either Google Gemini or OpenAI's ChatGPT to really hone out my ideas, get the, get the core concepts of what I want to be portrayed in, in this video. So when you're watching this, you should be nitpicking, nitpicking, um, what what do you want what would you want in this is this feasible could could this actually be done you know how many people can can could do this could i earn an income from this you know these and, and think of how you would want to do it because i can only lead you to the well you know i can't make you drink the water so i, I want you guys to to really think about that and when you're watching this but in my honest opinion Everything I say in this video can be done and should be done to really help our society reach its full potential. Um, so that's that. And now I will play y'all a little something. Presence to niggas, I don't want presents. Around me, you sound me, I don't want you to ever bounce. See, I don't care how you allow me, that shit will make you lousy. And walk with my anxiety, that's why that's why I need anxiety. That's why that's why I like privacy, that's why I move quietly. Okay, so I'm gonna be talking about three things mainly in this video. So they are this thing called the Digital Transformation Act. Basic human income, often referred to as universal basic income. And the last thing is a decentralized digital mar or decentralized data marketplace. I chose this one, the data marketplace specifically because I think that it has the greatest impact to, to help our society. And it goes along well with the Digital Transformation Act, you know, but I thought of many um, decentralized applications. They're acronymed DAPPS, D-A-P-P-S. Um, I thought of many applications of the, like these. I'm going to start with the Digital Transformation Act. And I have my notes here to keep me on track because um, I will go off topic quite quite frequently and you will see but these notes will just always steer me back to 
what we're doing, what we're talking about. Um, but the first thing that I want to get you guys to think about is imagine our founding fathers who created the legal documents that have stood the test of time and are still abided by, you know, the U.S. Constitution, the Declaration of Independence, the Bill of Rights. I want you guys to think if those documents didn't exist, but they instead written them in the year 2024, would they mention the internet in those documents? The obvious answer is yes. You know, we live in a, a very digital world and it's only our lives are only becoming more digitalized so that would be the first point of such document making that our lives have become digital and will only increasingly become more digital digital now going into the specifics of because you know th this should be a, a a government document going into the specifics of it is like figuring out who should police the internet essentially police these applications and police everything that's technical technically relevant the first point that i want to make is i think that it is important that we have input and representation from every trade craft every demographic <clears throat> you know your your architects your construction workers your fast food workers your your nurses your your doctors your lawyers your software developers project managers you know and then people from all of those industries but black white asian Muslim, Spanish, you know, every, to to really garner input from every <clears throat> everyone, and some some numbers that I have for you guys. So there is five hundred and I believe thirty seven federal politicians. Yeah. 537 federal politicians and going off the data with the U.S. citizen, U.S. population of 330 million, each politician, each politician roughly equates to the representation of 611,000 people. Okay. And for state politicians, all those included is 7,433. And that would equate to roughly 42,000 people that they represent. One politician represents 42,000 people. I want to propose the question, is that too much? Um, I believe so. You know, I, I would compare this situation to, you know, being in a war. Um, and you're listening to your commander or your general, and do you think 42,000 people are just going to all listen to your general or commander without any resistance or opposing ideas? N no, you know, if the commander says, okay, we need to build a tunnel and we need to go under the city and attack them that way. And, but then you could have people saying, why don't we disperse 10,000 people all around and just hit them from everywhere? Why don't we just have them just fly over or whatnot? You know, my, my point is you wouldn't just have a couple of different opinions. You would have hundreds or even thousands of different opinions. So forming a representative group which could sort of act as like brand ambassadors essentially would be the point of this type of document. And the goal is you wouldn't want any single person to have more power over another. Um, like one vote is one vote. Doesn't matter if it's 
the richest person or the poorest person or the blackest person or the whitest person, you know, it's just one vote, one, one token. And this type of democratic representation can, can be achieved through the blockchain. What would these people be doing essentially? Well, these people would be tasked with collecting input from the public and then communicating among everyone who is a representative to really hone out the ideas, hone out what we really need, what needs to be researched, what needs to be implemented, what needs to be in development. Um, I believe this should be the case because now we have people who are in public office who are often over 60 years old who don't understand technology, even in its slightest, don't understand the innovation that is ongoing daily. Um, you can argue that, well, neither will the architects or the construction workers or anything. But the point is that these people all will are involved digitally. You know, they have cell phones. They have computers and m most likely when they go to their job, their inter where they work, they have an interface that they operate on. So they're pretty much always embedded in these pixels and screens and technology. These people would be tasked with presenting findings and all the implementations and whatnot, and they would give it to actual politicians that they should, that we should force them to act on. And it shouldn't be something where uh, blue, blue has more people in the house, so they get to decide what's going on. If they don't like it, they don't like it. Sorry. Same with red, you know. I believe the political structure is completely outdated, you know. I'm 28 years old. I believe I'm the core demographic of what our country wants to be in the workforce, to be expressing self-thinking, to, to challenge societal norms. And I genuinely don't understand the, how the government system works. You know, we have the electoral college. I mean, although I, I do have an understanding of what that does, but you know, your house of representatives and Congress, and then your Supreme court, and then the presidency and all of that in conjunction, like, what the fuck is what? What? Who? How do we get things approved? You know, that that's a very lengthy process, and dealt with tons of delays, tons of people arguing on different sides over over the stupidest of points, you know, most of the time it's just driven by PACs, political action committees, and the dollars back behind them to, to fuel uh, special interest groups. And we need people who aren't controlled by money, who aren't controlled by a political allegiance. You know, we need people who think with their heart and that's it. And think of what is morally right, what is morally wrong, and let these people decide the technical implementations. I'm, I'm jumping out of order, but I want to make sure I mention the, the core things that I want to do in this, in this Digital Transformation Act. So I know that I've already expressed the idea of the application where we were earning cryptocurrency for going to school. I think that it should be a law or a part of our society that well, not a law, but an incentive, you know, to be technically trained on not code. No one, not everyone has to be a software developer or understand code, but just people who are understand, understand the uses of tech, understand phishing scams, understand social engineering when they're trying to be hacked, how to identify fake news. You know, we need to encourage people to to do this, to understand this. And I think the best way is to 
create a a yearly exam because you know that the tech industry changes a lot and hacks become more sophisticated so and this could be compared to like a an sol when you were in high school or whatever but passing this exam you should get like a something similar to a stimulus check but in cryptocurrency one person could probably argue that well, this would only fuel people to go into tech industry and not your nurses. And I would argue no, because it, it's not something that delves deep into the concepts of technology. It's something just on the baseline that people should understand in every industry. And we should incentivize that. Baby, you had me tend to swipe and I ain't think you'd end up like and swipe the way to windows wiping. one thing that you hate about the current internet structure i really hate the terms of service and conditions whatever the fuck you want to call it they make these these documents so lengthy so filled with so much legal jargon that no one wants to read it no one wants to understand it you've just pretty much signed your life away just from downloading the app or using something you know i think we need people to to summarize these for us and and one and one quick paragraph be able to have a summary of what the core things that this app app is doing what data they're collecting um and let me um, let me backtrack a little bit because i need to tell you that this type of application everything is financially incentivized you know so these people they this whole platform, this governance platform, it it uses a token, a utility token that you know can be bought, bought and sold, can be exchanged for real money, um, and to pretty much not limit, well, to limit the power that one could hold, so people don't control more tokens over time or whatever. It just needs to be a each year or every two years just like how they are in politics we need to replace everyone no one will be in in the system for for over x amount of time so that way to always keep ideas fresh always keep people new people engaged and eager to be the ones helping decide these types of things but this, this document isn't entirely focused on those, these people, the brand ambassadors. That's what I'm going to refer to them as. They, this document also needs to address data privacy, which I will also discuss more in the next part of the data marketplace. But currently, just from downloading and using an app, you know, we, these companies who collect our data, they sell that off and they make huge amounts of profits off of us, you know, because they, they form these personas and they just know and when so much data collected on us that they just send us such good advertisements that, you know, it, it would, you would start to think that they're watching you. And who's not going to engage in an advertisement if it's something that you're interested in? But it should be considered illegal that how these advertisements are formed because, you know, this is our data and we should profit from that. So these people, this document needs to explicitly limit tech companies startups data brokers data collectors on the internet and it's our responsibility to to figure out what's feasible for an application to function but not collect any data you know because <clears throat> just from downloading your app you don't need to 
know my name, my address, my my age, my my everything, you know. Thinking of this in, in technical terms, I should just be, if I download an app, I should be user 94261894. Nothing related to me at all. You know, just a random series of characters, essentially, in, in a database entry. But then the more that you interact with the with an application, the more that you could probably... Never mind. I'm not going down that route. This Digital Transformation Act, it needs to limit tech companies with their data privacy and also their algorithms and to safeguard our interest, especially AI companies, because AI is supposed to be a technology that is used in conjunction with blockchain to really enhance our society. These two innovative technology structures should not be separated. They need to be together to really form the things that the, the research, the financial benefits, all of that. They should be working together. And you know, Bitcoin first came out in 2008. And artificial intelligence really became popular about two years ago when ChatGPT uh, came out and really took off. But so we had a 14 year advantage on and in, incorporating cryptocurrency and blockchain into our 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 daily life, our structure. But, you know, legal barriers have presented that people are afraid because they know the benefits of what a blockchain with smart contracts will be able to do. And that is why these cryptocurrencies have not gone to zero. You know, Bitcoin, it, it's purely a financial component. It, it doesn't do the same thing as like, I'm using Ethereum because that's the main one at this point. Because Bitcoin doesn't su support smart contracts. And smart contracts are pieces of code that you can put on a blockchain that will run forever. That don't need to be, don't need to have an overseer that can be fully automated. You know, like if, think of it, if you're going to a DMV, you know, and you have to sit there for, for an hour or so just to fill out a couple papers, you could... Ideally, just have that smart contract on the blockchain to manually automate the process of filling out whatever. So, boom, that whole industry is replaced right there. You know, I hope you guys can see the 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 importance of this technology. I know a lot of people are probably wondering why can we not vote digitally yet. Well. The government is going to say because they face legal, well, they face hacking issues or manipulation from the system and blah, blah, blah. But with the blockchain and everything transparent, you know, that could be impossible to, to, to happen because we could see exactly how many people voted and what state how many people voted in each county. And, you know, of course, you could only vote with legal, if you were a legal citizen. Th that's my viewpoint on the immigration crisis. People who are not legal citizens shouldn't be able to vote. Um, but the blockchain would allow that to, to make everything transparent. And then, but you could argue, you know, People could be selling their votes or whatnot. There's another point that I wanted to make with it, but I can't think of it right now. But I always want to come back to incentivizing us, you know. Voting should be a way to... Because currently, that's our only way to really feel like we're in a democracy, is to vote. But, you know, 
we should be incentivized to vote through cryptocurrency. Um, the government just prints money left and right. So with, with nothing, with no institutional value behind those paper bills. But we could pretty much, let's just say every year you vote, you get $5 in cryptocurrency. And, but the more consecutive years you vote, the more cryptocurrency, like you could get a, a multiplier in terms of a reward for the second year, for the fifth year, for the 10th year. And yeah. Um, while I think of the final points that I want to make, I mean, the real doc document digital transformation act will will be lengthy you know there will be tons of things but like i said this is a discussion among everyone not just me i'm just presenting the idea to you guys and i want you guys to really hone out the specifics um taxes how much tax dollars do does the united states garner every year what do they do with that money you know, we're sending all this money to Ukraine. Most of the time, they're just saying it's in weapons that we then send to them. So that's the money that we're sending. But if you require us to pay taxes, you should also require us to decide where our taxes go. And with a public ledger like the blockchain, we could decide that, you know, we could... You could tell us that, okay, you have 10 things that you need to rank in order the, of the importance of what, what you deem important. And number one would get 30% of your tax dollars. Number two would get 10%, three, 10%. And then the last seven, you know, divide that among 50%. And then that's how your tax dollars will be sent. And then we could... By doing that on the blockchain, we could we could see that where what everyone prioritizes and that the things that we prioritize are actually getting the money that we want them to. You know, do you value your safety with the military? Do you value education, public facilities, your your leisurely activities? your transportation methods, you know, what do, what do you value? Where should your money go? That, that should be the thinking towards that. that this whole digital transformation act needs to make sure it's doing is it's allowing AI to to work to support our existence and not us and not the other way around that we support its, its existence so it eventually will overtake us because that dystopian idea where robots just all take over at some point is that feasible or not? I mean, I would say yes, but it depends on how everything is implemented. So we need to make sure 
we need to create preventive measures so that doesn't happen. So one idea that I have for it is that AI agents, your robots or whatever, they operate in a coin, their own utility token to, to, to do things, you know, and they can only send these coins to humans. And my, the example that just one example I have is for like a social media thing, you know, they, they submit these coins to, to users who create engaging content, unique content, excuse me. Um, of course, like everything that is financially incentivized, there will always be people trying to manipulate the system. And that's where, you know, robust testing comes into place. Um, we would need to have human moderators for an application like this. And, you know, it would even be possible for people who are, you know, like shy and don't post on social media. They just enjoy the content, but they, if they knew that they could just create content and be, and receive benefit for it, they would do so. Like you could submit content to an algorithm that, you know, would never be seen by nobody. That would be part of it. And then if that content is unique enough that you, an AI agent would reward you. And yeah, the, these AI agents could reward you, but this is, that is just for a, a social media idea. You know, that, that doesn't have to be the use case. You know, that could be, it could be anything, you know, writing a review, just writing a book, um, creating more humans, you know, incentivizing having sex and repopulating the earth. Um, just many different ways to be incentivized to, to do things all financially, you know, that's what gets people going. That's what everyone wants is money. And these types of things, Previously, all these types of money making mechanisms have all been centralized. And I believe that's why people are skeptical to really open up the innovation on blockchain because once they do, the floodgates are open, you guys. You know, it it's every man for himself out here. Make as much money as you can. Um and this is in regards to Bitcoin, you know, because Bitcoin is a, a truly innovative piece of technology. You know, people were trying for decades to figure out how to implement such system. And the last Bitcoin is supposed to be mined in, well, before I say, say that, all of the applications that I'm talking about can be backed by Bitcoin because, you know, you can break it down to fractions of, of a cent with like a with a currency like it with any type of cryptocurrency, you know, so. All these all the government funding and applications and whatnot, they can all be backed by Bitcoin to pretty much ensure that everything that we do has value. Um, and that instead of like, because, you know, they're printing money out of thin air, but what if you're printing the money because it's all, it's backed by Bitcoin, you know? So the point, last point I'm making is the last Bitcoin is supposed to be mined in the year, around the year 2140. So and I believe that the inventor, Satoshi Nakamoto, I think was the inventor's name. It's, nobody knows who it is, whether the person or a group, nobody knows. But I think the inventor of this 
designed it for for the last one to be done then because by that time the new financial structure will have been invented that way bitcoin will no longer be necessary um and i mean that because it will be using quantum artificial intelligence what so um that's why there is a huge investment going on with artificial intelligence right now you know nvidia is like i think it was just been announced that they were like the most valuable company globally because they're the chip makers behind the language models for these algorithms and ultimately what ai will be able to do is it will be able to pretty much all verification will be able will be able to happen instantaneously so hacking and all of that will become obsolete it won't exist because it will be able to verify that yes this person is this person sending this email this person has sent this e has sent an email 1000 times and it is the same person i am with this person i know it, it is i know it is them um do you see why that's important that's all i will say on it because i don't think it needs much elab much more elaboration well I know you can say, what you're probably saying is, fuck, 2140, that's how long all this shit's gonna take. I'm not doing none of this shit, fuck that. Well, that's for a new wave of, of technology being created, a new, a new financial system. But before we get there, we need the blockchain. We need the smart contracts to to really get us there. So this Digital Transformation Act needs to support those ideas. And now, since I have concluded with the Digital Transformation Act, let's talk about basic human income and the decentralized data marketplace okay so now we're talking about the decentralized data marketplace and basic human income um, but as you can see this is a new day new fit so don't judge me for piecing a piecing together a video in different segments on different days and you know i also have this little blemish on my face i'm not immune to acne um yeah but so this platform it's a a place where users are compensated for sharing their anonymous data at various levels of sensitivity you can think of it as you can think of the sensitivity levels as your social security number your driver's license your passport your and then another level could be your address, your birth date. Um, another level could be your income, your marital status, your your debts, your credits, whatever. Um, and another would be your health data, you know, your medications, your dietary habits. Are you diagnosed with anything? And then the final one would be your hobbies, your interest. Um, so, and how you would need to think of it is that the these sensitivity levels of your data are are worth more depending on what you're sharing. So, obviously, you're never going to want to share your social security number unless you're filling out, you know, government documents or whatever. But for your location tracking or whatever, you know, that would probably be your most expensive piece of data that you could 
form a buyer seller agreement with a uh, potential business or um, organization. Um, and as you you'll see in this video, this part of the video, I'm looking at my notes a little bit more because um, this part is a little bit more nuanced. It, the the specifics are are harder to to explain. So that's why I'm, I'm going by my notes and still we'll, we'll venture off track a little bit, but these will always got me back. Um, <clears throat> so the most important thing to consider with a platform like this is where it will be built. I think the key thing with anything like this will need to be, it will need to be interoperable, meaning that it needs to be able to communicate with different blockchains because some blockchains are fundamentally better and can support things that different things that another one can't. Um, and plus, there are many blockchains. You know, one can be specifically used for finance. One can be used for gaming. One is like could be your health place, your health data, and you you kind of get the point. So the best place that i think that this could be that this could be achieved is on polka dot um let me first tell you how i became aware of polka dot so beeple he is a, a a digital artist who who sold an nft for like 69 million dollars um to this person named metacoven and when i first became interested in nfts um, there was this place that had like Metacoven as a guest speaker that I had signed up for and it was like a, a virtual thing and at the end of the the meeting he like opened it up for questions and he actually answered one of my questions I mean I only asked him where I could find his NFTs at and he he told me but someone else asked him about potential invest in investment opportunities this isn't financial advice so don't take it but he mentioned polka dot and when i researched polka dot that's when i kind of started to piece everything together because when i first got introduced to blockchain you know i was very weary on what how why are there so many won't they need to be able to communicate with each other and that's the the fundamental thing that polka dot kind of aims to solve and I'm a believer in that piece of technology, but the bad thing is it's very much in its infancy because I'd like to, I would talk about this later, but since we're talking about it now, you know, this platform is, it needs to be not only handle a platform, a decentralized application like this, that doesn't just ideally doesn't support um excuse me a platform that doesn't support just the united states population of 330 million but supports the globe's population um and not only that it will need to support hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of applications Maybe not of the scale of this data marketplace, but we would need to think of the infrastructure similar to how the internet works. You know, the internet doesn't slow down the more people that get on the internet. The only limiting factor with internet is the access to fast internet speeds. So that is how we need to think of the infrastructure for a platform like this. It needs to be ultra scalable, infinitely scalable. Um, but I want to first break down the, the differences between a centralized and decentralized structure of data collecting. So in a centralized structure, data brokers collect aggregate and sell your data 
exclusively without your permission. And this data is collected from different places, you know, your websites, your apps, public records, you know, what you store online or what you post online. Um, if you've ever been arrested or whatnot, criminal offenses. Uh, so that's a centralized way of data collecting, but in this decentralized way, um, it would enable us to control our data and enable us to control its value, meaning we would be able to monetize it, sell it, and figure out what it's worth. Um, and, and in a centralized data collecting method, you know, your, your information is normally stored in one or two places, like all of your information together. But in a decentralized way, your information would be stored across nodes or blocks. This would be more secure because in a centralized way, if there's a data breach, then users, then the hacker will automatically have all of your data. And I'd like to give the example that happened recently with the AT&T um, scandal, you know. There was a six, six month time period where if you're a, a customer of AT&T, then all of your, your calls and your text messages were leaked in a data breach. And they're not going to, to do anything about that. They're just going to send you an email and say, hey, your information was in this data breach. You should change your password, sorry. Um, we, there's currently no way for us to hold them responsible. You know, we're not going to see any compensation for our data being leaked in that. And who knows how that data can be used to, to, to hack us to fish us in different ways. But back to the decentralized way, it's stored across nodes. So you can think of it as, I'll give an example of buying something online. What, what information is collected when you buy something online? You know, who bought it, where it's getting shipped, what you bought and the price. So that's four separate categories. And we can think of it as your information would be not all of that purchase information for one order would not be stored on one block or one node. It will be dispersed among four blocks. So if, so if there was a data breach, which would be harder in a decentralized way because everything is encrypted. If there's a data breach on one node, the hacker would only hypothetically get information to what you bought. They wouldn't know who bought it, where it's getting sent or how much it was, you know, they would just be able to look at one thing on that, on that node. So let's go back to the, the lack of user control. We don't have a say so in the data that is collected on us currently or who it's shared with and who, when it's shared with someone, what do they do with that data? You know, we would like to know if someone has purchased a million records of a certain demographic or certain target audience, we would like to know what they plan on using that for, you know? Those things should be transparent. And currently it's very opaque. We have no idea. We don't even know the companies who are, um, the biggest players in the data, data collecting. Um, cycle in this decentralized model, we could see because everything is on chain, you know, and it wouldn't be something to where we would be sending them our data because then they could just keep that data forever and then the, this process will become pretty much like the old model. How it would be designed is all of your data is on chain and up to, up to date with what you do currently, not what you did a year ago. 
and they would have access to it and access to it meaning they could get that get that data and send it into an algorithm which the algorithm would be on chain and we could directly see the results that it produced using our data um and that would be uh that ties along to a point that i want to make that it's think of your data as being leased you know they have access to it for maybe 24 hours and they will need to get what they need to do within that time frame and yeah i think this model is uh, adaptable to many could would be adaptable to many users and businesses as well because first of all it takes out the middleman in the data collecting process so the people who want your information they wouldn't need to to raggle or haggle with people who are are selling it so and it would create a it would be transparent because we would be explicitly giving them access to what we want them to you know we would know exactly the information they have you know because now you know if you just have your your name and your hobbies and interests it's most likely that this data collector knows where you live you know knows um what you watch on netflix most frequently mm, I'm, i want to talk about the benefits of this now um so the main one of a decentralized way of storing and sharing our data would be the empowerment of of, of us its user base to determine exactly what our data is worth you know how many people access this access this what how are advertisements formed using my data excuse me um and it would create a data economy you know <clears throat> meaning that just like a, a a stock market you know things are going to go up and down based on certain developments or discoveries or whatever so in that sense you know maybe around holidays christmas time people our data is going to become more valuable because businesses are going to want to to advertise to you so it would be widely understood among the general population that our data among this time is a much more valuable commodity um and same for you know like valentine's day people if, if they a company knows that you have a significant other and they want and people always buy a gift for their partner on valentine's day they're going to want to advertise to people who or find the people who have a partner who plan on getting them something so they can recommend them things to get them um our data is going to be more valuable then um, and, and this would create a fair distribution of value on what, uh, what each thing is worth. Um, <clears throat> so I want to give the example of a restaurant opening up in your hometown. Um, let's just say hypothetically that this restaurant, they have $10,000 that they are offering its citizens to to help form their their food menu and their drink menu um well let's just say this restaurant is in north carolina um this restaurant is not going to want to advertise to people who are in texas they're going to want people who are in north carolina so from that sense they're going to need your your location data to see if you're in a certain vicinity of the restaurant um and then to think about it more, we can 
it would pretty much be you against your neighbor trying to form a buyer seller agreement with this with this business on whose data they should uh whose data they should buy um you know your data is offered at a lower price but maybe your neighbor's is a family and they go out to eat more um compared to you you probably would just go out maybe twice a month and this your neighbor goes out once every week and they order alcohol. So their input to the algorithm or to their, like sharing their data would be worth more to that business. Um, so that's how you would need to look at it. And this type of marketplace, data marketplace would fuel innovation and competition to from not the user base, but the people who are actually um, buying your data. You know, it, I don't know of many innovative ways currently, I haven't thought of that, but there is definitely many ways to, to create interesting ways of data collection. Um, you know, maybe a business will say for a restaurant, not only will they pay you, but maybe within the first opening week, you'll get like a 50% off or a free drink or whatever for just participating in the data collection. Um, and who doesn't love free shit? But the ultimate, ultimately the biggest thing with this type of application would be, well, that would be beneficial to a, a business would be the data quality. It would be accurate up to the minute of the person that they're trying to collect from because maybe data that they're currently buying, it's out of date. Maybe it's from last year or two years ago. So it won't have your newest hobbies or your newest interest on what you do or whatnot. And fresh data is a very um, Im important thing. And this type of platform, it aligns with data privacy regulations. You know, currently, you know, governments, they're saying they have these documents or create these things in place to support data privacy and say, and that they'll hold these businesses accountable if your information is not secure, but until a government agency really adopts a decentralized platform, we shouldn't take it seriously because it would still be subject of them going out and if they believe that they have a bad actor going out, and even if they, they don't, they just want to maybe threaten someone with what they have done. I, I don't know, but they, could just subpoena and say, yeah, we have permission that to believe that this person is a bad actor and blah, blah, blah. But I would, and I would argue that that type of, from a government standpoint, that would still be possible in an application like this because they would just have to convince the majority, you know, the majority think of them as our brand ambassadors. Like I talked about in the digital transformation act, those same that same type of concept would be here as well, um, where they kind of make decisions on the platform and how it's governed and whatnot. So they would just need to um, convince them that they have evidence to believe that this person is a bad actor. And then, then they could get the information that they need from, from us from the ambassadors. When I realized you were meant for me, I relied on you mentally. The train so stormy, yeah. yeah. She loves me or she loves me not. She lost me, we untied the night. So Now I'm going to talk about the challenges with potential application like this. And 
obviously the main one, well, it, it won't be obvious to y'all, but the biggest one is the technical complexity of this type of application because not only will it is polka dot, I suggested it be built on, it's in its infancy, but this application isn't even in development yet, as far as I know. Uh, so, and you know, there is going to be super robust testing that would need to be involved in. You know, it's very easy to sit up here and talk about this shit, um, the concepts and how it should very vaguely be implemented, but it's much, much, much harder for this type of application to be built, to be scaled, to handle its potential user base. And especially because everything is incentivized, you know, incorporating a, a cryptocurrency that this platform operates on. Um, it's technically complex. So that's why we need more people to uh, thinking about this type of things. And one solution that I have for a potential um, way to do that is I think it should be required in every higher education degree that a blockchain course is required because, you know, this is just a, a, a data collecting or data marketplace idea. There are thousands, hundreds of thousands of ideas on how a decentralized structure can be applied to many things. Um, and I know that you guys know if you went to college, they have your your basic study that you need to take, you know, fucking biology, history. Why the fuck if I want to be a writer or a coder, what what do I need biology or to know about history? Um, it's simply a way for them to collect more money. Uh, so in that sense, I think that a, a blockchain course should be required. The next challenge with an idea like this would be user adoption. But my argument to it would be if users are financially satisfied with the results of the platform, then other users will want to adopt it. So that will be my argument to it. And going, this kind of ties in with the technical complexity, but the interoperability of this type of platform is crucial because you don't want to have to pretty much like sell your data on different places. You just want to, would be, you would want to upload it on one place and these places are able to, to do it in, in one place. Um, it would be totally redundant for it to, for it not to be in one place. And I would like to compare this to a current structure that I, that I think is flawed which I think hope that Ethereum name service hopes to kind of like fix. Um, so currently, you know, you have your social media platforms, you have your, your TikTok, your Instagram, your Twitter, or your X, whatever the fuck you want to call it. And most likely you guys don't have the same username on each of those platforms, unless you're just super unique and set out specifically to do so. And wouldn't it be nice if you could have one place where you just post all of your content and all of your audience, your, your, your audience would be following you in one place. That way you could bring your audience from each platform to pretty much give you the biggest reach in one place. Um, and you can include Facebook with this too, because I know <clears throat> social media influencers, they're still people too. They probably have, or have a Facebook profile where they're friends with people who they grew up with and talk to about just normal shit. Um, and from that point, you know, you could make a platform like that to be, to have like, okay, this separate the category into friends and followers and friends could have a more intimate 
relationship on your content with than a, just a follower. I ventured off a little bit there, but just just food for thought. Um, and the final challenge with a a platform like this would be the regulation uncertainty, because. You know, I've already explained how difficult it is to get things approved and laws passed and whatnot, but we should force them for force governments to 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 act on a platform like this because it will be beneficial to us greatly. And you know, The laws and standards are different in USA than they are compared to China, compared to London, compared to United, the United Kingdom, compared to Russia. And you know, this, this platform should be designed to, to be able to interact with each country, but you know, we shouldn't design our platform to adhere to these countries' standards on data privacy or data collection. They should, create systems that interact with our platform how they want it to. Um, so our platform should be the standard on data collection and these other countries and jurisdictions should adhere to it. We shouldn't adhere to them. Um, and this would be done by, you know, creating sandbox environments. This is a type of place where things are in development for a, a platform um, where where developers are able to to build without actually deploying things on a on a system i wanted to see if there are any other points that I, that i miss with this I haven't even tied in how basic human income. Uh, fuck. So I wanted to tie this in to, to your health data. Uh, you, you, you see, I'm, I'm just all over the place. Uh, but I, I wanted to mention this in here because ultimately th this will become a thing. Um, it's too widely discussed about at this point for it not to ultimately become a thing. And my idea for it is um, a way that generates income for humans just by us, but I wanted to think of a way of how can it actually benefit humanity? How can it um, solve limitations or innovate in terms of like medicine and vaccines and whatnot. So what I thought of is what do all humans do? We eat, sleep, and defecate or shit. So from that sense, um, those would be how we're rewarded our basic human income. Um, because from from doing it that way, it would ensure that humans are are trying to better their lives and live healthy, live to to the longest to have the longest tenure possible of, of their life. Um, I know you guys are probably wondering how how would we do this? Would we just like upload pictures of our food and our shit and do what? Um, you know, ultimately, uh, this type of mechanism would be incorporated with biotechnology. Biotechnology would automatically upload, okay, this person ate, this person just used the bathroom, this person slept for six to 10 hours, whatever. And, um, But that's that's a ways away. So, in in terms of like 
before we get to that, you know, everything would be on chain. So, you know, you wouldn't have to be insecure about posting whatever or uploading whatever to the blockchain because it would just be an artificial and uh, an AI agent who would be, you know, analyzing this data, looking at the metadata to see, okay, this is not the same photo from yesterday or not the same upload from yesterday it because you know people probably eat the same meal multiple times well multiple times a day and that shouldn't be a problem with a system like this and that would be able to be recognized through the metadata but you know obviously any system that is financially incentivized that will be open to or susceptible to manipulation and from that sense things would just need to be widely tested um what else what other point do i want to make with this i wanted to elaborate further on was you know by us sharing this data and putting it on chain and having an ai agent be the person to analyze and aggregate all of this data hopefully from hundreds of millions of people to and then start aggregating that up over years and years worth of information you know we could start to identify um when potentially cancer will start to exist in your body it will be able to um and then because ultimately ai will probably be the peop the technology to solve a lot of medical questions in terms of you know uh, a cure for cancer and things like that from just various from aggregating tons and tons of um scans you know people's habits on what they eat their genetics and it shouldn't be a way it, it shouldn't be this type of information shouldn't be centralized. Um, it should be decentralized and an artificial intelligence who have no moral or who have no bias to a, towards a certain agenda who just are programmed to, to adhere to their code. So that's why this type of thing would be super beneficial to be on chain because that's when the true innovation and research will start to happen but i think that is all of the the points that i want to make um with the decentralized data marketplace and basic human income um so i know this was a long video and if you watch the whole thing kudos to you um because I know I probably I ventured off a lot and probably probably lost you guys at some points, but hopefully it was you learned something and can understand the. If if you want to just take one thing away from this whole video, I would want you to to look up smart contracts and blockchain because I believe it's the most important thing for these types of applications to to become something. Um, it's a really a, a revolutionary piece of technology that I believe is crucial to our longevity, to evolution, and to us being able to to profit financially from from the internet and being ourselves. Um, And so I want to, to leave you guys with that. And the last thing that I want to say is, you know, I am making this video and releasing it alongside my NFT dick appointment um, featuring AI Drake. And it would mean the world if someone went and bought that. I know it's an expensive price, but hopefully do the song, do my through my lyrics and through this video you're you're able to see that i'm worth that i'm worth more than that and um 
ultimately, I just want to be someone who who leaves the world a better place than I found it. Um, I do my best at what I can with the resources that I have, but I know I'm capable of more. And by buying it, you would give me, help me get the resources to, to do more and encourage me to be more vocal about things like this. Because like I said, I'm, I'm a shy person. I don't enjoy doing this type of stuff. And what some, a potential investor or owner of this song should know is there's only one one version that you will own it. You will be the first person to to support me, to to fund my goals, to fund my vision on the the ecosystem that I hope to to encourage people to be a part of. Um, so yeah um that's it thank you for watching need to give it up holding you back every day relax need to relax always on my ass Talking about what you could have fucking had Now I'm taking what you had Like I took what you had And I'm giving less I want it more I'm working more I'm working smarter And harder Nigga, I'm proud of the fact I'm from the bottom No place but higher Started in the holler Had the hoes holler and holler Louder and louder To see who loud louder You know my loud louder When I'm prouder